Welcome to uh, Windows Wear Live. Uh, my name is Jolene Mujica. I'm the head of Trends and Tours for Windows Wear, and I'm doing the sort of Tuesday editions of our Windows Wear Live. And today we're going to uh, talk about hospitality in retail. So last week, thank you to all of you guys who joined us for our Earth Day Sustainability in Retail chat. So this week, uh, we're going to tackle hospitality. And it is so large that we're actually going to split this into two, um, just because there is so much to cover and so much material. So we're going to be doing um, food and fashion this week. And then we're going to be doing um, the other end of hospitality, which is hotel destination next Tuesday. So tune in for that. Um, so let's go ahead and dive right in. So hospitality and retail, food and fashion, part one. So We've been hearing this term, by the way, this is entirely meant to be interactive. So if you have been to these restaurants, been to these pop-ups, been to these food trucks, I want to hear about it. I want to hear about your experience. I want to hear whether you thought it was great, all feedback, um, because ultimately, you know, talking about these things is one thing and then actually experiencing them is a whole other thing. So I know that some of our staff at Windowsware has been to some of these locations, um, but if you've been, chime in, let me know. All right, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. So we've been hearing uh, the term experiential retail for some time now, right? And it's begun to sort of expand into the realm of hospitality. And it makes perfect sense because given 70% of millennial consumers are increasingly choosing to spend their income on experiences rather than um, traditional products, right? Clothes, shoes, bags. So this positions brands in a sort of great place to kind of pivot and start to partner with famous chefs, fast food chains, whatever it is to kind of explore that symmetry, right? And luxury brands have always been about more than just clothes or putting a logo on something. Inherently, it should be about, you know, legacy and heritage. And in terms of any hospitality venture, it should definitely bleed into the idea of lifestyle. So quick breakdown of hospitality. There are four segments in the hospitality industry. It's food and beverage, travel and tourism, lodging, and then re recreation. Today, we're gonna tackle food and beverage. So the food and beverage sector is the largest segment in the hospitality, hands down. We're gonna focus on that today. And like I said, part two next week, we'll focus on uh, travel hotel and destination hospitality, all right? So let's jump right in, boop. There we go. So food and fashion in pop culture, right? So cross-marketing and cross-brand collaborations have become this sort of definitive part of modern culture. We see it through every different sector in the retail industry, and we see this cross-pollination always happening. And food and fashion, while in the sort of 80s may have been like not necessarily cozy, now it makes perfect sense. So let's take a look at some really fun examples. And there are literally millions. And feel free, again, to chime in if you have a favorite collaboration or someone that you think particularly did this well um, in the past couple of years or that you're currently sort of supporting. So let's start uh, upper left corner with um, Coffee and Clothes. Coffee and Clothes is basically a building couture coffee, right? This is made to order. Nothing is more social than in the element of sort of food and beverage than coffee, right? Think about all the coffee shops you go to, whether you're sitting at your laptop, doing some work, meeting someone over coffee, right? It is a social food element. And Clothes and Coffee managed to sort of fuse and bridge together the idea of like foodstagram and food Instagram, this big, large movement and uh, coffee, right? So it creates this per perfect sort of idea to create this digital content along with the consumption of delicious coffee. So this here you can see their uh, Hermes and their Prada. Then we move on to the Moschino and McDonald's collection. Um, this was particularly cute and fun because Jeremy Scott, who's the creative director of Moschino, he considers himself this kind of connoisseur of what he lovingly calls junk culture. So anything from Taco Bell to My Little Pony, Moschino's kind of like the king of kitsch. And McDonald's felt like the perfect fast food kitschy brand for them. McDonald's in and of itself is also the largest fast food chain worldwide. So it's instantly recognizable, right? If you put a Happy Meal in front of a child, they know exactly what that is. You don't need to tell them, right? So it's a great idea of mixing highbrow, lowbrow, this like respected Italian house uh, paired with a, you know, Happy Meal and 99 cent nuggets, right? Super fun. 
Then we have the Adidas and Arizona Iced Tea collaboration. Sneaker culture has always been about collaboration and this pop-up took that kind of um, marquee Arizona Iced Tea Aztec inspired print that the cans are so famous for and sold it at a pop-up shop for 99 cents, right? So the entire lure of Arizona is that it's really affordable. It's 99 cents for like 40 fluid ounces. And the shoes were actually sold for 99 cents. The, um, the pop-up was right here in New York City and it was actually so popular that it got shut down before they even got to let people in. That's how kind of um, obsessive sneakerheads and sneaker culture has be become, but I thought it was really cool and really innovative, right? Same idea with the Moschino and the McDonald's, right? Highbrow, lowbrow. Then we have a really fun collaboration between Dolce & Gabbana and Smeg, who builds most of the world's industrial kitchens and um, this was a really cool collaboration because it was extremely limited. They only built 100 of these design refrigerators. They also built ovens and toasters and mixers, but the fridges were sort of the, um, the, the standout here. And each of them were hand painted. So they were designed by Domenico Dolce and Stefano Gabbana, and they were hand painted by Italian artists with all of the typical DG house codes, right? So the Sicilian folklore, um, Italian battlefields, right? These are things that you see throughout their collections um, every single season. It's a part of their house code. Um, I don't know what the refrigerators retailed for, but I do know that they sold out within a month, right? So they, they were pricey. They were yeah, pricey. they were very I pricey. I think they were in the ballpark of like $30,000. Yes, some, yes. Somewhere in that ballpark. I remember um, seeing like a kitchen appliance, like a blender or something for like 4K. So I can only yeah, imagine this. Exactly. If the blender's four grand, imagine the refrigerator, right? That's only 100, right? And you have to keep in mind, pieces like these really are for collectors. This isn't meant to be mass distrib distributed, right? It is sort of like collecting a piece of art, right? And then we move into our center bottom tile with the collaboration between uh, Nike and Mamafuku. If you don't recognize that gentleman in the background, that's David Chang. He's one of New York's most famous restaurateurs. He's behind Mamafuku, Noodle Bar, Milk Bar, Sam Bar, right? If you've been to New York City, these are sort of um, staples in the East Village. He designed skate shoes in solidarity with the skate community. There's actually um, a park nearby his first restaurant and a lot of skaters go there and they would then come to eat at Momofuku. So it has a certain audience that's attracted um, and they use the design. The denim on the shoe is the same exact denim that the aprons uh, that the servers uniforms wear for um, all of their aprons. And Mamafuku actually translates in Japanese to Lucky Peach. So on the bottom corner, you can see the famous little Lucky Peach. They made two different kinds of uh, sneaker designs. And the first sneaker had the number 163 on the back and the other had the number 207, which are actually the addresses of Mamafuku, um, Sambar and Noodle Bar. So a little sort of shout out to their um, New York roots. And then we end with the uh, the Pokemon bar. I don't know if any of you have kids or grandkids or if you yourself know what Pokemon Go is, but in 2017, the summer of 2017, it took over the world. Pokemon um, is of course a TV show, uh, video game. And I know we had our chat on gamification a couple weeks ago with Raul and Nicole. Um, and this sort of took that to the next level, right? This idea of gamifying something and creating a geolocation for an entire community of gamers. It gave them a place to go and took them to an outdoor space called a gym and all of these trainers played on this video game. So they thought if we can mobilize hundreds and thousands of people into one given space, they will definitely come to the bar and the cafe. Cafe. So the bar, the Pokemon bar was uh, one month long. It was opened in Brooklyn and the experience sold out in less than 10 minutes. So that's sort of the power of the video game industry, right? The gaming industry, if you think about it, it's a $120 billion industry. So diving into the food and beverage, it makes perfect sense, right? If you think about things like Comic-Con and we'll talk about Hello Kitty a little later on. Um, and also think about it this way, right? Think about the last time you went to Disney World with your kid, your grandkid. The first thing they want is the Mickey Mouse shaped ice cream, right? So brand loyalty is sort of bought at a very young age. So bringing that into the gaming world and the food world, it's just, it's a chef's kiss, right? It makes perfect sense. 
So let's jump ahead. Uh, Pop-ups and food trucks. Again, if any of you have been to these, please let us know. These are just some of our favorites. We could spend hours and hours just talking about the hundreds of thousands of these, but these are some of our uh, favorite highlights. So um, cafes, right? Pop-ups, food trucks, they, brands always use this as a form of sort of brand reinforcement, right? It's also great for brand activations. They're fun, they're Instagrammable. It's a great platform for them to show presentation and artistic design, craftsmanship. There's always an innate attention to detail, which I think is amazing. And food trucks and pop-ups are also all temporary. So really it drives sense of urgency to consumers to get there and be the first in line, right? There's also an accessibility component to this. So think about all of these big brands that we're about to talk about, Saint Laurent, Chanel, Dior, right? Not everyone can walk into these retail spaces and purchase a $3,000 saddlebag, right? But you still want that brand experience. So being able to walk up to the Saint Laurent food truck and get a croissant and a coffee has the same brand trademarks but and character but in the form of an experience rather than you know a product so here we have a collaboration between um saint laurent and saint ambro in milan so the creative director they're a very famous uh, milanese pastry shop that actually opened in 1936 um, and it is artistic director Antonio Vaccarelli's favorite bakery. So he wanted to collaborate them. They have these very famous, beautiful pink boxes. Um, so that soft pink with the sort of Yves Saint Laurent black is really sleek. It's really uh, on par with their sort of brand aesthetic. It made perfect sense. Um, there's something really sort of soft and feminine, but still really chic about it. Then they also created uh, something called the YSL Cafe, and this was um, opened for Fashion Week. So they opened this particular cafe for Paris Fashion Week a couple years ago. And again, quintessential Saint Laurent, it's sleek, it's black, everything was matted. In contrast, they have this really stark neon light. So it feels retro without feeling dated. And for every coffee that you purchased, you got a QR code, which gave you a playlist that was compiled by Saint Laurent. And so you can listen to all their music on Spotify, right? So fusing in the sort of food industry, the fashion industry, and now the music industry, right? So I love this because you can see that the marble is matte. It's really beautiful Italian marble and everything has the Saint Laurent logo from the coffee cups on the bottom to all of the fixtures, right? Moving on, um, Raul mentioned this and it's so true. I agree 100%. He mentioned this uh, last time he spoke when we talked about Chanel and their, um, their gaming center that they open, but Chanel is the king of branding, right? Hands down, they have the most elaborate production value of any luxury brand worldwide. The Chanel runway shows are the most sought after ticket in the industry, right? If you've ever seen a Chanel show, even, you know, in person, that's amazing. But if you've seen them on their uh, live streams or their Instagram, you know, it's pretty incredible, right? So when they build something, they're not a traditional lifestyle brand, but they are masters of creating destination. And we see it in everything that they do. In fact, our uh, creative team has a really beautiful, um, really beautiful Chanel inspired uh, Instagram on our Insta story feed today. So take a look at that so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so the J-12 Yacht Club, this was uh, right here in New York in the Hamptons at Shelter Island. They basically created this really beautiful um, yacht club experience in homage to the J-12 watch that they launched, right? So they translated, this was the outside of it. This was a pre-existing space that they sort of took over for a couple of weekends. Let's take a look at the inside. And while the inside remains very uh, nautical and very yachty, right? It still translates that classic black and white house code that we know for from Chanel into more of a seaside aesthetic, right? So they even had Billie Eilish, she performed for the opening. Um, they offered amenities like badminton and surfing and checkers. You can see the checkerboards right here. What you don't see because they're too tiny is the double C Chanel logo on those checkers. There was a wine garden, a beautiful vineyard. There was a game room. This is part of the game room. And in the ground floor was the boutique where you could actually purchase the J12 watches. So here again, you see part of the experience on the beach. They had curbside, curbside, that's 
different. I'm thinking in terms of what, where we're at now. Um, they had table side service, right? So they had servers dressed in beautiful sort of a Chanel yacht uh, uniforms come out and serve you all kinds of beautiful classic cocktails. You could see the Chanel surfboard, which was from their cruise collection and the J 12 yacht that, uh, went around for a sunset cruise every day. People uh, and guests could actually go on the yacht for a sunset cruise. I didn't actually know this, but the J-12 yacht was what inspired the J-12 watch, right? So tying in the idea of inspiration um, and just high-end luxury, right? There's nothing more decadent and luxurious than taking a cruise on a yacht provided by Chanel, right? It's like the height of luxury. Moving on to Bottega Veneta, their diner in Miami. So this was to celebrate the opening of their new boutique in Miami during Art Basel. The creative director, Daniel Lee, opened what he called the Bottega Veneta Diner. It was basically like this gilded experience of luxury and fun and high-end fashion meets French fries, right? So again, highbrow, lowbrow, the menus were rebranded. They served spiked milkshakes with gold straws at the counters. Burgers were wrapped in gold foil. Gold foil and gold wrapping is a part of the Bottega house code. So it tied in uh, who they are as a brand. And what's smart is that they took over an existing space, right? So I'm from Miami. This is the 11th Street Diner. The 11th Street Diner has been there since the 30s and it is a staple to South Beach, Right? I remember as a kid going to the beach and then going to the diner um, and eating a meal before we went home. So it's classic, it's Art Deco, it's true to Miami. Um, and the 11th Street Diner is this sort of like paramount dining car experience. It's open 24 hours. You could go there at 4 a.m. and see people sort of pouring out of a club. You could go there at 3 p.m. and see families. And uh, in the next slide, we've got the exterior. And then they recreated, they actually built their own version of the 11th Street Diner uniforms, which are these really sweet casual t-shirts that are very sort of accessible. And they slapped the Bottega, um, the uh, logo on there. Moving on to London, the Patagonia activist campaign. So we talked about P Patagonia last week. You know, they're known for their environmental activism. So they launched this place where people could kind of go and share ideas, right? So they host these daily sessions on activism, workshops on carbon literacy, seminars on um, habitat conservation, right? And this was particularly smart because of the way that Patagonia gets to advocate for their values, right? Coffee, all the coffee that was served is free trade, of course, is organic, and all of the pastries supported all of small, um, small local businesses within the London area. So making everything local, making everything accessible. Here you can see just where all of those seminars are. You could sign up. Um, it was really cool. It was a really cool way for them to engage their fan base and engage their customers in a way that wasn't selling them outerwear. Moving on, one of my personal favorites, I actually went to this truck. I waited 20 minutes in line for a slice of pizza and it was absolutely worth it. Um, nothing to me is more ubiquitous to New York City than a slice of pizza, right? When people think of New York food at like its fundamental core, it's like the the uh, the pretzel right that you see, um, you know, from the guy on a corner in the park and a New York slice of pizza. So this was really perfect. Um, it was a brand activation for the Louis Vuitton Soho pop up store during 2018 Men's Fashion Week. They teamed up with local pizzeria, which was um, Neapolitan Pizza. Um, and if you see on the right corner, I guess your left corner, you'll see that it says um, they've got the hashtags there to sort of promote online engagement. This got a lot of hype and a lot of love on Instagram. It was only there for, I think, two days. I went on that first Friday. And like I said, the line was 20 minutes long. But there's something exciting about waiting in line, A of all, for something that's free. Um, but also for something that's branded, right? And there's sort of a community that you kind Kind of create with these people online. Um, this is just like plain fun. Did you guys go, Nicole or Raul? Did you see the Louis Vuitton pizza truck? Maybe or John? Anyone? I didn't see it. No, I didn't okay. see it. Yeah, it was hard to spot. I mean, it was here and gone very quickly. But um, that's part of the cool thing too, right? Creating like limited access makes something way cooler, right? I feel like mm -hmm. that's what, that's the boss around so many of these projects is like oh it's like the question of like have you seen it what is it what i can like get is 
I feel like, I don't know, maybe the brands does it on purpose. I don't know, because it's not something that they announce massively. It's something that either you see or you follow them on Instagram or if somebody told you. So I guess, in my opinion, that is the cool part about these projects, especially in New York. New Yorkers love like a good secret thing. So Exactly. Yes. It's all about word of mouth, right? You have to know, you have to be there right moment, right time, right? Which creates these sort of like instant, like, you know, the, all this instant hype. Um, so moving on to Monaco, um, Pantone Cafe. I love this. I think this is a, first of all, a brilliant use of color blocking, which is when you think of the world's most well-known color company, um, they asked themselves, they decided to open a food pop-up and thought, what does color taste like? And that to me is really innovative. They cultivated this menu of pastries and juices and cocktails, all of them with Pantone signature color swatches. And this is a really great example of a food pop-up enabling a company to sort of take creative risks in its brand by stepping outside of its typical business model, right? So we don't think of Pantone and food. I don't think of paint and food, but there's absolutely an idea of color and food, right? And color drives the way we buy things. So here we see um, this slushy to the left um, is the Pantone color of the year. So 2020's color of the year is classic blue. And then we have this really fun sort of Pantone clear water, right? So it's their water bottles given their uh, unique Pantone codes. Moving on to Cartier, the Cactus de Cartier rooftop oasis. So for the launch of their cactus inspired summer collection, they opened the rooftop at the uh, Cartier mansion in New York City for the first time since they opened their doors in 1917. So this rooftop has always been in their arsenal and they have never opened it for the public, which is such a crime, but they did it in the perfect way, right? So this was their desert cabana. The Cartier desert cabana was sort of underscored the themes of the collection, right? So they had succulents and rattan furniture, sculptural plants, and it was all meant to sort of, um, they also had these beautiful handcrafted cocktails made from mezcal and cactus and aloe and hibiscus. So everything was very um, light and ephemeral and really sort of soft and kind of cool. Um, the collection was all these really beautiful bespoke jewels and they were on view in the Oasis room. So this next this next picture is the Oasis Room. And in the Oasis Room, which was like warm orange and red and yellow, it was meant to replicate the idea of the setting sun in a desert. In the center, you can actually see it's very teeny tiny, but you can see all of that collection on view. The collection was for sale inside the store, not at this particular exhibit or this bar, um, but you could take a look at it and it was a lot of fun. I went to this exhibit, it was really, really beautiful and the cocktails were really delicious. I will too. Yes. Yeah, it was super fun. So um, Amazon. Um, so these pop-ups and these sort of food moments aren't necessarily just for the luxury houses or the fast or the, uh, the sort of brands, right? Media companies like Amazon, Netflix, Disney, they have these built-in audiences and there is always an expectation to be entertained, right? So when Amazon uh, sort of capitalized on their big win, their Emmy Award winning show, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. It was a huge success for them. So they're like, how do we bring this to the people other than through our subscriber service, right? And what's amazing about this particular piece is that the show itself, if you're a fan of the show, it's a Valentine to New York City, right? So it takes place in New York. It's shot in New York. They use local New York actors um, in addition to the, uh, the cast. And they filmed at, um, or they replicated the Carnegie Deli. So for all my old school New Yorkers, right? The Carnegie Deli actually closed its doors in 2016, but they built a replica of it for Marvelous Miss Maisel. And then they basically said, we're going to create this event where you can step into the Carnegie Deli and be along Mitch Maisel and the entire um, cast of characters. So what was amazing about this is that they took it a step further and not only built the deli, but they hired actors to pose as servers, hosts, patrons sitting among you to build this immersive theatrical experience as well as a functioning restaurant, right? At the end of your meal, you ordered whatever you wanted on the menu and then it was wink, wink, this one's on midge, right? So the entire experience wasn't only free, um, but it was immersive, which to me was amazing. This was my favorite exhibit of 2018. I absolutely loved it. Favorite food experience rather. Moving on to the Nike Joyride. This was opened in Brooklyn in New York City. Nike created a really, really smart way to incent incentivize consumers. So 
they basically exchanged like monetary currency for money to miles. So in order to buy any, anything in the cafe, any of the food, any of the products, you actually had to run. So you had to download the Nike Run Club app and post um, your results to social media. You had to run at least one mile to qualify. And then you had to use the hashtag uh, run to eat in order to get um, any of the products. And then true to form, that's brilliant because A of All is an athletic brand. It's a sneaker brand. It was for the launch of the Nike Joyride sneaker. And if you didn't have the sneakers or if you went in wearing, you know, a pair of espadrilles, not a problem. They would give you socks. They would give you the sneakers. They would download the app with you and say, go for a run, come right back. And that created this really cool shared experience, right? So here's the next slide where you can see uh, the shop where everything was for sale, right? So um, it was really smart. You know, you're engaging digitally through your app, you're um, engaging in mass numbers, right? And you have this sort of beautiful shared experience. I didn't go, but I heard it was really cool. I love the idea of instead of exchanging money, you exchange a different kind of currency. That to me is really smart. Moving on to Hello Kitty. So in 2014, Sanrio launched Hello Kitty Con, and we know that sort of nerd culture is huge, right? Whether it's video games or Comic-Con or Marvel, whatever it is, um, it drives people to a space, right? So the Hello Kitty truck launched, it was directly outside of Hello Kitty Con, and it was such a hit that since 2014, it's been traveling around the United States. So here's what it looks like when it's popped open. Um, and it is a pop open cafe. What's really smart about this too is that you have to follow them on uh, Twitter, on Facebook and on Instagram. And every week they will release where they are in the United States. So they travel everywhere. They started in LA and they've gone to Dallas, to Miami, to Seattle, to St. Louis. Um, you can follow the truck on um, again, on their social media, and all of the products that they feature in their truck are exclusive to the Hello Kitty Cafe. So you can't get them anywhere else in the world. So again, exclusive content is kind of the key. Um, and I mean, how cute is that, right? Like who doesn't want a Hello Kitty macaroon? Just absolutely adorable. The Facebook Privacy Cafe. So it's always interesting when you have a brand activation that's exciting because you're launching some form of a new product or a new collection, right? But this is particularly interesting because it was in direct response to a scandal, right? So this was in response to the Cambridge Analytica um, scandal that Facebook sort of, cre you know, Facebook was sort of um, underwent a couple of years ago. So they decided to open something called the Privacy Cafe. I believe there were 10 of them globally. Most of them were in the UK. And what they did was they offered digital privacy checkups with text over free coffee. So the coffee was free and you went in with your laptop or your phone and they would essentially help you, um, if you're a Facebook user, to check your settings on their platform. And what's interesting is that one in four Facebook users have no idea that how to set their privacy settings, right? Their accounts aren't even um, set to anything, which means they're basically not aware of uh, how vulnerable they are, right? So in order to mitigate that, Facebook said, hey, we wanna help, we wanna be on the right end of this. Um, we wanna help you customize your data settings. So uh, this was their way of addressing that sort of criticism that Facebook has been hit with over privacy issues over the past couple of years. Um, because allegedly they've been very reckless with people's personal data. Um, so it was a smart way to engage people, right? You kind of quote unquote, have no excuse now if you could just come in um, and get your privacy settings checked. Moving on to the Coach uh, Carney's Diner. So similar to what Bottega did, Coach partnered up with um, LA's probably most famous diner, which is the Carney Diner. It's this beautiful um, vintage stagecoach train car uh, diner and coach in true form, they wrapped their sort of signature monogram all over it using their patchwork. And this was to launch this, the uh, art of signature collection and coach commissioned artists from around the globe to create these beautiful color box blocked uh, bags. And then they added all this patchwork to it. So they had artists from all over the world building these really beautiful, unique pieces. And then you could go in and have a meal. You can see on the right side, again, diner style food, right? A burger and fries and everything was monogrammed with the classic Coach C's, all of the patchwork, you know, anywhere from the ketchup, ketchup bottles to, you know, the little um, Coca-Cola or whatever. 
So then we move on to uh, luxury design. And Raul, keep an eye on uh, the clock for me. Um, we're about a little over halfway through. Um, luxury design through the culinary lens. So that was just a small handful of some of the pop-ups, right? The food uh, sort of industry building into pop-ups. But what happens when a luxury house decides to open a proper restaurant, right? It's a tricky endeavor because 60% of new restaurants fail within the first year, right? And when a brand enters in a partnership with a chef or restaurant group, it has to be profitable on both fronts, right? It's, it's not a charity, right? So Michelin stars and sort of, um, Michelin stars become just as important as insignia, insignias, right? And famous chefs, if you think about it, have started to become household names as much as famous designers have. I can recognize Anthony Bourdain and Tom Colicchio and Gordon Ramsay just as quickly as I recognize Gabrielle Coco Chanel or Alexander McQueen, right? They've become sort of these household names. Um, so pairing together that like Venn diagram of these two separate circles just becomes one big giant circle. And food is a really important social element, right? There's a social dimension to fashion and there is absolutely a social dimension to uh, dining and retail spaces since they're changing and evolving. This is a really smart way to slow down the retail experience and still allow customers to have a branded moment that isn't in the form of a product. And that doesn't only mean, you know, sticking a monogram on a cupcake. It really means translating the essence of a brand into something edible, right? It should not only be a feast, it should also be a feast for the eyes, right? So let's take a look at some of these proverbial uh, feast for the eyes. We start uh, with the Gucci Osteria, which is in Florence. It opened in 2018. Um, Gucci was founded in Florence, which is why uh, they decided to open this space here. And Gucci has become the sort of crown jewel of the caring group empire, right? I think what Alessandro Michele, the creative director, has done is proven that he's not only a critical success, but he's a commercial success, right? Everyone loves Gucci. We're using it as a verb now, right? I mean, just for proof in the pudding, Gucci's sales skyrocketed 70% in his first year as a creative director. So there's a lot of power and clout behind him, right? And this is the sort of love child of Alessandro and the CEO, Marco um, Bizzari, and his childhood best friend who happens to be a three-star Michelin rated chef. His name is Massimo Bottura. And Massimo Bottura has been, is a restaurateur throughout Italy and created this beautiful one-of-a-kind um, menu. So this is located inside of their um the Gucci Museo, so their compound. Um, if any of you have ever been there, right, there's the Gucci Garden and then they have the restaurant. Um, the menu is, it's a sort of Italian flair. It's all produce, uh, all the produce is rather organic. It's sourced locally. Um, he really believes in aesthetics and ethics, right? It's also really intimate. Most of the restaurants we're looking at are very small. This one particularly has 50 seats. So it's very intimate, uh, which means it's also a lot harder to get into, right? And everything about this to me screams Gucci, right? All of the aesthetics, all of the house codes that we recognize, right? Antique chairs, and antique mirrors, tufted velvet banquettes, right? The Gucci green and the walls, even the hidden engravings. If you look above where the bathroom is, you can see that there's this beautiful gold engraving throughout the space, which is usually in Latin. And you see um, all of the, um, the cutlery is that sort of soft Gucci pink, right? Um, and this is really smart because it's a sort of proof of concept, right? The Gucci brand can basically has learned how to successfully translate the feeling of their authentic luxury experience outside of traditional retail into a restaurant. It's so beautiful. I definitely want to. I was this past summer. I was next to. So this is. I think this is next to the store. Um, it is. Yeah. It's and right next right. to the store in the Gucci Garden. And I went uh, last year, I went to LA and I passed by and, and one of my friends was at a, at a beauty store and I was like, oh, I'll wait for you here. And I went into Gucci and there were not enough sale associates to, uh, to uh, handle the amount of people that was waiting to be, uh, to be, to be like served, to be kind of like uh, sell something. It was, yeah. it was fascinating. It was fascinating, kind of like uh, ridiculous at a point where there were people making a line to get uh, in touch with somebody from sales, which is 
Wow, it's great. I, I yeah, that's a good problem to have it. and a bad problem to have, right? Like yeah. the best in that, it, you know, you've got you've got too much demand for your supply, which is a good problem, but then you don't want to also taint the customer experience, right? So it's sort yeah. of double. At that point, the experience wasn't luxury at that point because it was like, it was too noisy, too crowded, too many people. Yeah. Right. So moving on to uh, the king of monograms, right? Like Louis Vuitton. This is uh, Le Café V. It's in Osaka. Um, it's located at the top of the Maison and it features a uh, sort of classic fusion menu by uh, Yosuke Suga, who's a very famous uh, Japanese chef. And Louis Vuitton has always been about localization in everything that they do. So this to me is really smart. What immediately catches my eye about this is how bright it is, right? When I think of Louis Vuitton, I don't necessarily think of like very bright. Um, there's other words that come to mind, but that's not it. But this space is really, really smartly designed. This is the bar area. There's also a giant terrace, which is why all that light is coming in. And Louis Vuitton commissioned their, um, in-house artist, his name is um, Tokujin uh, Koshikawa, who designs all of the Louis Vuitton objects and home collections for them. So they already have this big arsenal of artists that they work with in their um, Savoir Faire collections, right? And all of their uh, sort of one-of-a-kind couture house buildings. So why not incorporate that into the restaurant? He actually designed all of the tableware for the restaurant. Um, which includes the house codes of the quadrifoils and the fleur-de-lis. And if you look in the back corner, you can see the Louis Vuitton trunks, right? Which is an homage to their travel and their exotic history um, and their craftsmanship, right? So this was a really cool venture for them. It actually just opened before the sort of pandemic hit. So I'm curious to see how they're going to be doing, you know, once things sort of stabilize and get back to normal. Moving on, the first time I heard about Barluche was actually from Raul because he showed me his pictures and my immediate thought was like, oh my God, this looks like a Wes Anderson fever dream. And it turns out it is, it is a Wes Anderson fever dream. Um, this is located inside the Fondazione Prada, which is their foundation, it's their museum space, right? <clears throat> and similar to what Gucci did, they built this, um, instead of it being a high-end restaurant, this is this quirky, typical Milanese cafe. It's a collaboration between Prada and and Wes Anderson. If you're not familiar, Wes Anderson is a film director. He directed The Royal Tenenbaums and Moonrise, uh, Moonrise Kingdom, um, a bunch of really sort of quirky oddball films. And Prada has always, I think of all the classic Italian houses, they have always celebrated Italian cinema. They're a very cinematic brand. So this idea of melting sort of Italian pop culture with film feels right, right? So from the soft pastels, the, there's pinball machines, the color block vinyl booths, right? For mica furniture, wooden wall pa paneling. It's all very evocative of like 50s, 60s cinema. And Wes Anderson said in an interview that this is his homage to Prada's vision of what a Fellini film would look like, right? So looking through the lens of a respected Italian uh, filmmaker through the lens of Prada. What was your, uh, uh, what was your experience like, Raul? It was delightful. We, Nicole and I went last year That's in the middle of the Nicole. summer. And uh, it's super cute place. It's super affordable. Uh, it's like, and it's, it's a great place for people watching also because you will see a lot of these Italian women like dressed like head to toe Prada and like super stylish, super like, it was amazing. I love yeah, that. And like, Wes like Anderson the was there. To the concert. <laughs> yeah, and Wes Anderson was there. Actually. Of course he was there. <laughs> I saw him. I just, I just didn't take a picture, but I, I saw him. That's amazing. So moving on to the Dior Cafe. Now there's multiple Dior locations, but this particular one I think I love. I've personally been to this one. Um, it's located in the outdoor terrace of the Miami Design District Boutique. It's on the roof. It's entirely open very Miami, right? Um, allegedly, Monsieur Dior himself loved to take coffee breaks and would always be seen at cafes um, throughout the day. So the immediate thing that struck me when I walked into the space was like the dominance of the house codes. The first thing you see, first of all, is the logo. Uh, and the second thing you notice is the famous, uh, the Toile de Jouy, the animal menagerie. Um, this is an 18th century French print that uh, it debuted at Dior in 1947 when um, Mr. Dior actually lined his entire boutique with it, right? So he didn't use it for the collections. It was a sort of experience that was exclusive to the inside of the store. And for the 2019 Cruise Collection, the creative director 
uh, Maria Grazia Curie brought the pattern back into the collections, right? It's very charming. It's magical. It feels like as if Dior designed this like whimsical zoo, right? All of the sculptures that you see are 3D. There, there were tigers, giraffes, monkeys, bears. Um, none of them were load bearing though. And I will say every Instagrammer on the planet tried to sit on that uh, tiger <laughs> and everyone <laughs> who worked there would lovingly and gently be like, oh, actually, let me take a photo for you, right? They would sort of, um, you know, in a not rude way, uh, say, you know, you can't actually sit there, uh, but we can take a photo for you that'll look fantastic, right? I, so I think that's a really smart way for them to know that um, while people are going to want to do that, right, um, they can sort of like mitigate that traffic in a, in a smart uh, customer service way. I also like that they incorporated like local flora and fauna from Miami. So they've got these really beautiful banyan trees and palm trees that are native to Miami. So it still has that kind of jungle zoo feel. The coffee was delicious, by the way, and it was also $22. <laughs> Luxury, right? Um, the Tiffany and Company Blue Box Cafe. So to me, no brand has a patent on color quite like Tiffany and Company. And we talked about them earlier, but actually the only company in the world that creates Tiffany Blue is Pantone. And it's Pantone 1837. 1837 was the year they were founded, right? So they add their house codes all the way into the way that they sort of um, build uh, anything, right? And their proprietary Robin Egg Blue is very inherent to their identity as a brand. So this restaurant to me was 60 years in the making. I mean, if you've ever seen Breakfast at Tiffany's, one of the, when we give our tours here in New York City, one of the most popular questions that the uh, sales associates at Tiffany get asked is, where's the cafe? Where can I eat? And this was before they opened this two years ago. And they would always lovingly say, you know, well, actually this is a jewelry store. We don't have a proper cafe. Um, that was just a movie. But if you want to see a picture of Audrey Hepburn, we have her here, right? And so finally, two years ago, they built the Blue Box Cafe. It was modeled to look like the inside of the iconic Tiffany Blue Box, right? Um, and when it opened two years ago, it was the most sought after reservation in the world. There's only a 24 person occupancy in there. It is also the most Instagrammed restaurant in the world. There's over 40,000 variations on the hashtag for the Tiffany Blue Box Cafe. And Breakfast at Tiffany's, of course, is the driving force for that. And Audrey Hepburn was always called the first lady of Tiffany. So their menu evolves seasonally. They have something called the 10 carat breakfast, which is the most famous item on their, um, on their menu. And you do dine, you can see in the photo on um, the sort of Tiffany signature dishes, the tea sets, the sterling silver cutlery, everything in the cafe is for sale in the store too. So again, translating like, a luxury dining experience into a retail experience. I just want to say, Jolene, that I've been trying to, um, I've been <laughs> trying to go, and no, there's still no one. Still table, no. So yeah, two years well. later. I mean, I know that currently Tiffany in Company is undergoing a renovation, so they're not going to be reopened until 2021. So the yeah. company is actually closed. But still, I mean, two years Even later, before. no one can yeah. get a reservation, and we know all yeah. the right people at this point to get. Yeah, in touch I give up. With. I it's, it's crazy, right? Who knows? Moving on, we've got the Fendi Cafe. Um, if you notice, Cafe has two Fs. That is uh, for the double Fs, which Karl Lagerfeld coined when he was the creative director at Fendi. It means fun fur. Um, this is, to me, stunning. It's monochromatic. It's designed by an artist named Joshua Vides, and Joshua Vides worked closely with the Fendi team to create something that was very Fendi and that was still very kind of edgy. Right. So while it almost looks a little Chanel esque to me, obviously with the double F's you see everywhere, it's it's iconically Fendi. Right. There's also this really cool speakeasy. If you look into the back wall, that black door, it's called the Peekaboo Bar. Um, guests who purchase the Peekaboo uh, baguette bag from Fendi can actually go inside and customize up to three elements um, in that bag. Very cool. Moving on to Starbucks. So this is interesting to me because Starbucks is not necessarily a part of the traditional sort of retail world, but Starbucks already has their brand identity in the hospitality sector. But I 
kept them on this list because to me, it's really important to show how incredible their brand elevation is with uh, the roastery, right? So the Starbucks, Starbucks Reso Reserve Roasteries were opened in, um, they did the first one in Seattle, right? They're based out of Seattle. Uh, the second one, they actually opened in Milan. And now there's one in New York City. I believe they have like five or seven or maybe even 10 at this point worldwide. Um, and when you walk into this space, if I took away the logo, no one would know it's a Starbucks, right? It, there's no plastic in the facility. There's no green mermaid logos. None of the traditional sort of hallmarks of Starbucks are evident in the space anywhere with the uh, sort of exception of the star. And you do see the mermaid being sort of reincarnated all the way in the back right corner or left corner for you guys. Um, uh, you can see the mermaid there, but it's a really sort of chic presentation. And what's really cool about the Starbucks Reserve Roasteries is that they are not, um, they're actually restaurants, right? So they offer coffee flights, tastings, they offer tours of their facility, roasting and brewing experiences, table service. They offer workshops on cultivations for beans and educating a free trade coffee. So it really is thought out and super, 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 super smart. And by the way, the price point is pretty much the same because most of the time you think, well, why would I go to the Starbucks Reserve Roastery, you know, for a $20 cup when I can just go to the chain across the street? Um, most of their coffees are within the same price point, um, but none of the regular menu is uh, available at the roasteries. It's all a one of a kind curated menu specifically for them. I go there all the time when I'm at Chelsea Market. It's a great experience. Moving on to Paris. So we have um, Jacquemus Citron, which is, uh, I mean, this to me is just dreamy, right? There's something, this is located inside of Gallery Lafayette. You can, um, this is the sort of brainchild of uh, Chef Ramon Macron. Um, and it's supposed to feel like the Mediterranean and they nailed it, right? It's complete with these beautiful sort of soft pink amphoras, real lemon trees. The furniture is all this sort of light wood. It's supposed to remind you of being in the South of France. All of the food on the menu is light and healthy. It's fresh fish, salads, a lot of citrus-based dishes, right? They're called citron, so that makes perfect sense. But there's something very light and airy and beautiful about this space. I have never been, but it's definitely a place um, where I feel like you can escape, right? They did a really good job of creating destination here, right? It feels light like the south of France. Moving on to uh, Intersect Lexus. So I love this because Lexus, you know, when you think of a car brand, you do not think of restaurants, you do not think of bars, right? Um, you would think, oh, you know, Maybe they would do something for, you know, a, I don't even know. Like, how do you fuse together a car brand uh, with food? But what they created in New York, Dubai, and Tokyo is a lifestyle hub, right? So they've got all these beautiful curated products. And they um, build these one-of-a-kind rotating restaurants. So in this space, and this is exclusive to New York, so the Dubai and the Tokyo location don't actually have this, but they have these four, uh, they call them the restaurant in residence, and every four months, the restaurant changes. So there's a new chef, similar to a museum exhibit, right? You go to a museum every four to six months, new exhibits are curated, and it, they basically create this culinary experience um, all the way down to the bar, right? The bar shifts and changes as the restaurant does, the menu changes. Currently, it's Chef Hussein Shazad who constructed this really cool Middle Eastern comfort food restaurant, and this is really smart of them because generally restaurants are contingent on repeat guests, right? People coming back again and again. And this allows for something really fresh and really new. Every four months you get something new. Um, this space was also voted, this is gonna sound really weird, but if you're from New York, you know how valuable this is. It was voted for the three years that they've been opened, the best public bathroom in New York City. New York City has a lack of public spaces and public restrooms. You always have to run into a Starbucks. And the bathroom at Intersect Lexus should be studied for design and for innovation. It is all hands-free. They have these stunning um, fixtures all over the walls. There's no other way to describe it other than just being there. Um, and which is kind of funny when you're talking about a public restroom, but it's really, really uh, smart. Boom. 
Moving on to 10 Corsicomo. So we've got one here in New York City, but the first one was in Milan. So Co Carla Susani was the uh, previous uh, editor-in-chief of Italian Vogue, and she wanted to sort of create this retail experiment, and that's what 10 Corsicomo was, right? It was part art gallery, part bookstore. There were capsule collections for designers that she specifically chose. Um, and so adding a restaurant to it felt really smart and natural because people were going in there and spending all this time in this kind of artsy complex, right? Everything is black and white, um, not necessarily the clothing in the capsule collections, but the aesthetic of everything. They use like all this beautiful Murano Italian glass to build, uh, to build out the restaurant and everything sort of very uh, sleek. It is a classic Italian, um, Italian menu. Moving on, like stark contrast into what we just saw. This is the uh, Saks Fifth Avenue in New York City. This is uh, La Avenue and Le Chalet. So this is all about real estate, right? Saks Fifth Avenue directly overlooks Rockefeller Center, which is like some of the most expensive real estate in the world. And when La Avenue and Le Chalet opened, it was like the place to be seen for Fashion Week. Gigi Hadid had her birthday there. Uh, Taylor Swift has been there. Rihanna, anyone and everyone has sort of uh, been in this space within the first six months of it opening, right? They paired up with um, Nico de Soto, which is one of the um, most famous mixologists in the world. He built a menu uh, of beautiful cocktails that is exclusive to this location and just by looking at it you can tell the entire space is inspired by the um by swiss alpine and sort of skiing right so it feels like a lodge they used reclaimed wood paneling um lots of decor uh, you know uh small sleds all of the animals that you see in there like the the sort of animal heads they are fake right nothing no animals were harmed during the making of this all the velvet upholstery uh it sort of just reminds me of a ski lodge in the middle of New York City. It is another space that I think really nails the idea of destination. Moving on to Shinola. Shinola in Detroit. Um, Detroit was sort of this um, hub for innovation and manufacturing in the US for decades, right? So this is more of a lounge space that they created, right? If you know Shinola, they're famous for their um, leather goods, for their watches, right? They make handcrafted um, journals, bikes, anything you can think of uh, made out of leather. So this space for them was a cafe, but also a lounge. And the banisters have the same wood that are rather the same leather that you can find on the, um, the watches themselves. And it's very sort of just clean and easy, just like um, the products that they sell, right? I like their notebooks. Moving on. So the epitome of lifestyle brand to me is Ralph Lauren, right? Anything and everything they do, they have an outlet for. This cafe, so Ralph's Coffee opened for New York Fashion Week. Um, they actually did their runway presentation in the Ralph Lauren mansion on Madison Avenue, and they opened the cafe as a sort of companion piece for it, and it stayed open. It was so popular that they absolutely loved it, and so they kept it open. Here you can see um, everything that I think of when I think of Ralph Lauren, right? The house codes, you see the teddy bears, you see the pinstripes, you see the use of florals, right? All of the coffee is free trade. It's a collaboration with La Colombe. Um, so it's really sort of clean and sleek and very Americana, very Ralph Lauren. And in contrast with that is the polo bar. The polo bar to me is the heart of Ralph Lauren. Um, it goes back to their equestrial roots, right? It's um, I love this space. I've only ever been to the bar. I've never been to the restaurant part. Uh, but the polo bar is, first of all, it's it's just horse heaven, right? Um, if you look at all the dark wood panels, it's immediately Ralph Lauren, um, all the way down to sort of the banquettes that are supposed to look like saddles, right? A lot of the photography on the walls is also done um, by Ralph's wife, Ricky Lauren, who is a photographer. Then Versace. So Versace is interesting. Kill me for mispronouncing that. Versace. Um, so Versace is actually the world's first luxury brand to ever branch into the hotel sector. Um, Vanitas is their first restaurant that they opened. Uh, and it's the Latin word essentially meaning vanity, right? So um, when we talk about the hotel sector next week, we'll show more of what that looks like. But it's a seafood restaurant. Um, 
it's decadent, it's beautiful, right? Versace gold foil oysters, right? It's so uh, over the top and absolutely <laughs> out of this world, right? Even down to the way, if you look at the fork, they chose a fork with three tines. That's supposed to represent Poseidon's trident, right? Poseidon being the god of the ocean. Um, and that ties into Versace's house codes, right? Their affinity for Greek mythology, Medusa being the house muse. Couple more to go here. We've got uh, Thomas, right, from Burberry. So Thomas's is named after the original founder of Burberry, which is uh, Thomas Burberry. And this serves as like classic British fare, fish and chips. They have an afternoon tea. It's very on brand. All of the ingredients are sourced from around the UK. They use local artisans. They use local farmers markets. It's sophisticated. It's polite, right? It's very British. The artwork was chosen by Ricardo Tichy, who's the creative director for Burberry. And it sort of mirrors a lot of their house codes, a lot of their campaigns, their runway shows, right? Um, this to me is very classic. Uh, sort of vintage Burberry. Then moving on, Chanel not only knows how to do a pop-up, right? They built a beautiful one-of-a-kind uh, restaurant called Beige. It's in Tokyo. Beige has been open since 2004 and still is really hard to get a seat at. So they uh, paired up with Michelin star chef um, Alan Ducasse to build a beautiful sort of French cuisine with um, local Japanese ingredients. So it's Japanese and French fusion. And to me, when I look at this, I'm like, ah, yes, there's Chanel, right? It's classic. You see the signature tweed, you see the gold and silver, the warm wood, the copper, um, all of it feels elevated. All of it feels Chanel, right? Even down to what you, when you step into the elevator, if you see on the right, that's what the elevator looks like, right? It's monogrammed, it's soft, it's feminine, it's Chanel. Then we move on to our second to last, uh, Giorgio Armani. So what is interesting is Giorgio Armani um, has the Armani Ristorante and they're global, right? So since 1998, Giorgio Armani has been building one of a kind culinary experiences around the world, right? We'll talk more about their uh, other hospitality ventures next week, but he's the sort of master of brand expansion and they have 20 restaurants globally, Cairo, Dubai, Milan, Munich, New York, and they all kind of boast this 1930s chic kind of muted tones, clean lines. They use beautiful Italian marble in all of their uh, restaurants. The ground floor also has their um, Armani Dolce, so you can buy all of their desserts. You can take them home um, in addition to going to the restaurants. And a big part of the Armani Ristorante um, initiative is teaming up with a charitable organization. So for Armani, giving back is just as important in the global hunger crisis as it is creating beautiful dining experiences. So they teamed up with Action Against Hunger and part of their proceeds annually go to that. So it's important to sort of put your money where your mouth is. Vivian Westwood Cafe and Soul. Uh, this was designed by uh, Simona Franchi, and it's basically inspired by an 18th century tea room, right? It includes all of the core elements that you can find in Vivian Westwood's brand. So her tartan plaid, you can see it on the teacups, uh, all of her pastoral imagery. It's very Marie Antoinette. Then we have D squared. This is our final one. Um, and if you're looking at it and thinking, why is there a picture of a pool and not a picture of a restaurant? And that's because Dan and Dean Caton, who are the uh, designers for D Squared, decided to open a restaurant that was a mini destination, right? So since they're two brothers, um, they opened a restaurant with two lounges and two swimming pools, right? So this is actually in Milan in their penthouse of the, the uh, D Squared um, headquarters. And they teamed up with a chef who actually came to them from Bulgari. So when Bulgari uh, opened their hotel chains, they had Elio Cironi creating the menus for them. So they brought him on board um, and the menu is seasonal. It's Italian. And again, this is kind of fun and playful because the two brothers kind of lovingly compete with one another. The idea of having two pools, two lounge spaces designed by each brother is really fun and really smart. From what I'm told, you cannot actually swim in the pool, um, although that hasn't been confirmed. <laughs> uh, there's nowhere that I could find that says uh, otherwise, but uh, there you have it. So um, let me bounce back here. So that does it for our edition of Hospitality and Retail Hospitality uh, 
sorry, hospitality and retail, food and fashion, right? So next Tuesday, we're going to tackle uh, the hotels and the destination experiences. Um, if you have any questions, I am here. Feel free to ask. Um, if you went to any of these spaces, please let me know. I want to hear about your experience. Um, as always, all of this material can be found on Windowsware on our website. Um, and please, oh, someone's chatting us. Let's see. Uh, please, by all means, uh, check it out on our website. Also, this Thursday, we are having our Windows Wear Live, um, a Legication and Retail Lighting Design with Quatrobi. So that'll be this Thursday at 3 p.m. Uh, with the team of Quatrobi. So tune into that. I'm excited uh, to hear what they have to say. Um, and again, next Tuesday, we're going to hit up some hospitality and hotels. Anyone has any questions? I will be here. If not, thank you so much for joining. As always, have a great afternoon. Hey, Jolie. Hi. Uh, it's Stefano. Hey, can I hey, ask Stefano. a question? Hey, Hi, Stefano. Of course. Yeah, of course. Um, how much do you think these are business extensions or marketing or client fidelization? I feel like for the most part, business extension, right? I feel like it's basically taking the idea of like diversifying portfolio, right? Saying, okay, we have the real estate. It's also interesting because a lot of them have the real estate anyway, right? So when you think of, you know, the Gucci or the Prada Foundation and the Gucci compound, right? They have all of this space anyway. So why not, instead of having a boutique that's four floors, um, you know, consolidate that space and add a restaurant. It's another element of customer engagement. So I do think it's about pushing the brand and diversifying the brand offering. Like I will, I will hundred percent think that Tiffany was making money out of that cafe because the prices were like higher. Uh, there were enough tables. Uh, you could not get a table. So I'm sure I I guess in some cases it's a matter of like just a marketing experience, like the San Laurent cafe, you know, it's already, they're already because, there. I mean, uh, they don't pay if, in if you think uh, the amount of revenue that they can bring in compared to the gross revenue of the brand, it's, you know, it's like peanuts. Yeah, it's minuscule, but it's still effective, right? Like, oh, Josiah, feel free to um, chime in because you're with LVMH, right? So uh, I think, and they, oh yeah, they just said that. So marketing, right? That's really what it's all about too. I mean, people want to be seen at wearing the best clothes. They want to be seen eating at the best restaurants, right? right? And if you can tie in the brand identity, you know, that always makes for a smart business move, right? Right, exactly. The ROI is variable. Yeah, you're not necessarily going to get a return on investment on one restaurant in one city, right? But you are going to get a crazy amount of engagement, right? I mean, just look at Tiffany and Company, right? To me, the Blue Box Cafe, 24 people, how effective is that really? And then you look at Instagram and 40,000 hits, right? That's mm -hmm. definitely got a, uh, that's a big ripple effect for them. So super and, smart. And Josias, what else do you have to add given your viewpoint? Yes, please. I would love to hear because LVMH is so brilliant at creating brand experiences across the board and given their portfolio, right? They, they've got Moet, they've got all these big, you know, Belvedere, all these big um, hospitality brands under their belt, not just the fashion brands. So yeah. Yeah. Brand awareness, consumer engagement. Yeah. Those are moments that you use a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Great feedback. Any other questions? Stefano, have you worked in something related to that, in something uh, related to hospitality in some projects? Um, not properly, more into like um, events like. I see. They're yeah. kind of like hidden in between an event and a marketing. Yeah. And yeah. Because I can see uh, the market to be keen to this um, type of uh, investment that they don't have a clear return um, yeah. right away because most of the times you don't sell anything rather than yeah. your brand, your presence, your Logo, yeah. Instagram um, yeah. situation. Uh, and I think this 
powerhouse and uh, brands are more suited for this uh, is like for most of the brands uh, that are like uh, selling or having a presence in New York, most of them probably they're not even profitable in their uh, uh, stores, but you have to be there. And most of these brands, uh, they do have the cafe or the restaurant or, you know, the situation to um, involve people and um, uh, push them to be their tool of marketing through Instagram or uh, yeah. whatever engaging uh, moment. Yeah, this last year when I was in Milan, uh, we went to the train station and there was like, uh, there was a little... Um, there's an Italian brand that make uh, ice pops, you know. Uh, but I don't, remember, I, could, I do not remember the brand of the ice pops. But then they were having kind of like a collaboration with Fendi. So the whole, the whole uh, little card was like uh, double F logos everywhere, mm -hmm. and even the ice pop had double F. So I, I saw that and I, I thought it was brilliant. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a victim of marketing, and and I thought it was, it's, it's just a great, uh, that was a great partnership. Yeah, I agree. And actually, that's funny because originally I had the Fendi Pops on the on the slideshow, but but it is um, it's instantly gratifying, right? There's something like really cool about walking around with a Tiffany and Company coffee or you know a uh, Louis Vuitton cupcake, right? It's not it, it's even though it's consumed, right, and it's not necessarily going to be the powerhouse or the core business of uh of the brand there's something tangible about it everyone has to eat right so why not eat designer you know it's, it's also another another way to do a great to do marketing these days that works better than an ad at a magazine or in the newspaper or like a tv commercial or something like that it's kind of like something that people can really experience touch smell eat get a piece of it and it's great just is saying also Bulgari Hotel, which, yeah, Jolene is going to touch all those uh, points next Tuesday because the hotel is another, is another whole world that it was, uh, that is amazing also. Ooh, yeah, the travel lot. sector of, of luxury and hospitality is its own beast, right? Because now you're talking about something much more permanent, you know, something yeah. much grander where the ROI can be huge and it has it's been. Expensive. Yeah, exactly. So when you're talking about destination, you know, it's very, very different. People are willing to spend a lot more on a hotel and an experience than they are on a meal, right? So the yeah. numbers jump up exponentially. So that's, we'll talk about that next week when uh, we jump into uh, that other end of hospitality. But yeah, it's great. Thanks for the, uh, the input, Josiah and, uh, and Stefano. And if any of you guys have been to any of these spaces or have any... Um, you know, Inside. experiences. We'd love to hear from them. Don't be shy. We're here. Do you, do you think there is any risk related to this type of, uh, let's now call it mar marketing, uh, um, you know, operations? Let's say someone has, you know, the food cart with burgers and someone feels sick after eating the burger. Do you think that in any way, uh -oh. the brand of the situation can be affected? Yeah, I mean, I think something going wrong in any form of a collaboration is uh, not necessarily the way a brand wants to be viewed, right? Yes, and Josiah, exactly. Wrong collaborations can lead to d dilution of brand and brand equity, 100%. I mean, I can't say it any better than that, right? I mean, we've seen this, especially in the food industry, right? Look at the disaster that Chipotle uh, underwent three years ago with yeah. the coli, right? They've never recovered, right? They've never recovered from that. Um, not even giving away free product, right? So it can be uh, devastating. And those are definitely risks you have to calculate when you're opening yeah. restaurants. But those are risks you have to calculate when you do any form of a any, any Yeah, if you right? go to McDonald's. Yeah. You no, know? yeah, exactly. It's not just McDonald's or Chipotle. You know, these kinds of risks have to be taken when you're doing any kind of cross brand pollinating. Um, you got to know who you're getting in bed with, so to speak, and make in, sure that they that their brand standards are as high as yours are. Yeah, in my personal opinion, I think it's more that they gain than they lose. That they can lose. Like I feel like they gain, especially now with social media, they gain so much brand awareness. 
people, it's crazy to have this space. And, and I mean, they, you know, Stefano, they design the spaces so you go and take a picture. That's, yeah, the spaces are thought about that and the lighting is thought about that. So I feel like it's just a brilliant way to engage with uh, younger audiences with uh, an audience that might not be necessary to like be able to buy something from you at a store, but they still want to post your picture and they're going to still talk about your logo and your brand. So just like more and more. I know. Yeah. This is like the Supreme effect too, right? Like to yes. me, Supreme is a brand that just sort of monopolized everything. They said, well, we're going to put our logo on everything and we're going to collaborate with everyone. And we were going to, you know, we're, we're going to sell a hammer with our logo on it that should retail for 20 bucks for 200, right? Like yeah. they've created this, um, what do you call it? This hype around it. And, and yeah. They, I think they're responsible for all the logomania that we're seeing right now anyway. Uh, but conspicuous consumption, that's the term I was looking for, right? All of a sudden, all this supply and demand for these things, that these inanimate objects that we wouldn't think twice about um, because, you know, Supreme sort of teamed up and collaborated with them. Oh, let's yeah. see, Nicole, she was excited to go uh, to Citron, but it was kind of disappointing. Interesting, interesting. That's an interesting uh, piece of feedback because it can also be one of those things that like looks can be deceiving, right? Yeah, yeah. It can be absolutely beautiful. And when you step foot there, the execution can be not what you saw, right? Um, yeah, for example, experience. I went to the Polo Bar uh, two years ago, last year, two years ago. And the experience is just like, it's just to the level to the store of Rob Lauren. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's insane. The, the smells, the, the people that is there, the way they speak to you, the, the whole thing is just the same Rob Lauren, waspy, uh, elegant experience. Uh, yeah, uh, the, I feel like that's why Ralph Lauren, um, Ralph Lauren really nails the idea of lifestyle, right? They're just so good at translating their house codes into everything that they do. And I agree that bar at the polo bar is just, you are in another world. You are in the world of Ralph yeah. Lauren at his yeah. ranch with his horses. Like it's really incredible. Yeah. The translation from like conception to design to execution, it's, it's, it's out of this world. They really nail it. And there's a lot of them that do that as well. I mean, I would love to yeah. go to LV, um, the Louis Vuitton uh, La Vie Cafe in Osaka, because I bet it's just so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, I think that's fine, Joe. Great. So um, again, thank you so much for um, coming today and for uh, enjoying this uh, presentation. And thank you for your feedback and your stories and your experiences. Uh, it's always so fun to sort of talk to other members of the industry who have yeah. their own insights and their own, um, you know, uh, awesome opinions to offer about the places they work or how their brands work. Um, so it's always invaluable for us. You know, we want to learn just as much as we want to teach. So it's really fun to engage with you guys. And thank you so much again for joining me. So again, next Tuesday is part two of hospitality, where we'll talk about hotels, travel destination. On Thursday, we've got our education, LED education in uh, production lighting design with the Quatrobi team. That's Thursday at 3 p.m. We hope to see you then. Have have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you for joining us, guys. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.